familiar with some of my work um, and some people, there might be some aspects of my practice that uh, people might not know about. So for this talk, um, I'm going to give a sort of brief outline to my painting practice uh, and then also some ways in which like some key developmental parts of my practice over the years, because um, some people might not know that I previously made work in sound and moving image um, and being a, like not not just painting focused, whereas my more recent work is definitely painting focused, but I feel like it's informed by a lot of the other more experimental and playful things that I've tried out throughout different phases of my practice. But um, yeah, so I was born in Hartlepool uh, and I'm based in Newcastle upon Tyne. Uh, and as I say, I primarily work in painting, but over the years I've worked in different materials too. Um, so let's get some images up. Um, so the slides I'm going to show for this first part, like some are um, a mix of old and new work. So this one's from this year that's in the Beep painting show that's currently on. Uh, it's called All That's Left Behind. Um, and then there's a mix of older work as well, so you can kind of see the difference in how my work's developed. Um, yeah, and this one is from a couple of years ago. And so all of the paintings that I'm going to show are all oil on canvas as well. Um, uh, oh, I should say as well, there'll be like time at the end for any questions. So if you make a note of anything you might want to ask as we're going along and then I'll, I'll fit in a nice chunk of time at the end for questions. Um, so yeah, so my painting practice is focused around painting and the moving image. Um, and it's always been a central concern in my practice. Um, so since graduating from Northumbria Uni in 2001, I've primarily been focused on painting. Um, and the paintings usually, uh, the source material is from moving images that are from a variety of sources. Uh, I usually take literally hundreds <laughs> of um, images, um, which I uh, then so sort of now I take I look through films on on my laptop, take a lot of photographs, and then I sort of narrow these down into ones that I might want to paint, and then from those I make drawings, and then from the drawings I make paintings. So I, I, there's usually behind like seven or eight paintings, there's usually quite a lot of a selection process that's gone on beforehand. Um, uh, and I usually I don't really focus on a particular genre or kind of image that I'm. Uh, there's sometimes a bit of a theme can develop with, within my work, but usually it's more like a gut feeling um, that I'll just be watching something and then I'll slowly go through frame by frame and then choose <clears throat> like the moment that grabs me. And sometimes I'm not even sure what it is, but it's just a gut feeling. Other times it's quite a directed search for uh, like costumes or fabrics or particular kind of imagery. Um, so the aim with my paintings is to try to slow down the act of looking and to invite the viewer to linger on moments that might otherwise go past so quickly you wouldn't you wouldn't see them so the paintings in a way are, are the, a way for me to slow down the sort of amount of the deluge of information that we see every day and provide a moment of quiet uh, contemplation uh, even though some of them are quite a bit more spooky and a bit more heavy in atmosphere there's still a feeling of slowing down um, that I want to put into the paintings. Uh, so currently a lot of my paintings this last two or three years are based on um, imagery that I've taken from 80s and 90s films and it, it's tending to be that the horror films are like really bad <laughs> horror films because I, I know that if I use those that pe the people are less likely to have seen them so less likely to recognise the imagery that I'm painting. Um, and. I think I'm drawn to the 80s and 90s as uh, as a sort of era to look for imagery because that's the the era that I grew up in I like absorbing the things around me um in the time of like physical media like cassette tapes and VHS and rather than digital formats that are more prevalent now so I grew up like with these physical formats that were more grainy and sort of had inf physical imperfections um so I'd like the paintings to have the idea of uh, exploring the idea of painting and storytelling. Um, so they usually, like I said, these passing moments that are in between the action, so that the bits that you probably wouldn't usually notice. And 
sort of touching on the traditions of vanitas or still life painting and the formal aspects of it from the history of painting and using those in my own way. Um, and I, as I say, I use imagery from 80s and 90s, quite terrible <laughs> films that I feel uh, it sort of makes it less likely that people are going to recognise. Because I found that even if I... Uh, even if I chose imagery that I felt was really, really obscure, I'd end up that someone would recognise it. So I've had to go even more obscure than I would have thought, because there's always some film nerd who'll be like, oh, that's off Star Trek or something. Like, so I've had to um, go even more obscure into the real depths of YouTube <laughs> to find some re truly horrible films. Um, and so, yeah, I'm interested in things being recognisable on one level, so there's enough to draw you in, but then it's not just a one-liner of, oh, that's off Jaws, or oh, that's off uh, like Citizen Kane or something, being able to recognise it. So it's quite important there's an ambiguity to the finished paintings. Um, and I've always been interested in, in what's at the periphery or what's at the edges of our day-to-day -day experience and what we'd notice. Um, so the, that idea of a fleeting moment that draws attention to a hidden layer of things that usually going on around us, but we don't notice because we're moving so fast, we don't see them. Um, yeah, so that's the little introduction to my paintings, um, roughly. I'll go back to talking more in detail about the painting, um, but I just wanted, as I mentioned, to touch on some areas uh, in my practice when I wasn't painting or when I was trying to find, uh, a, like, open up my painting practice. Um, so I've always really loved David Lynch um, since watching Twin Peaks on TV when I was like 10 or 11 and not really knowing what was going on, but found it very enticing. <laughs> um, so when I studied my MA, I uh, went to study my MA at Newcastle University in 2009. And because of the, um, the facilities and everything that were available at the university, I wanted to take advantage of those and I'd, and break apart my painting process. And I, because I'd always used moving images within my practice, I thought, why not have a go at trying to make a moving image myself um, as a way to sort of look at it from the other way around and sort of breaking apart the process of like, how do you make something that has a duration and a different kind of space? Um, so I was looking to David Lynch as I'd always been interested in him and I knew that from reading his biography uh, Room to Dream so if you haven't read that book it's really good there's a good audio book of David Lynch reading it as well um it's called A Room to Dream and um I was reading about how he actually started off as a painter so this is David Lynch in his painting studio in LA somewhere doing his crazy paintings <laughs> Um, and he said that when he started off as a painter and trained as a painter, but then he found it quite limiting. And he said he wanted to make paintings that somehow had a duration and a sense of movement and a little wind maybe, is the quote, which I, I th really caught my attention. I was like, oh, I kind of know what he means. So I thought I'd try and get a little bit of wind <laughs> into some of my paintings. Um, and then, so this, yeah, this is like around about 2010, 2011. Um, oops. And then I also was really into the films of Roy Anderson, the director, who started off as a commercial director, and then he moved into making feature length films. And again, they have this slowness, quite painterly quality that are quite staged and muted colours with a, a really particular sense of atmosphere that's really him that I found quite, again, found that quite uh, enticing and I kind of I just really loved the visual language that he developed because even though it was a moving image I felt like they all looked quite painterly um, and then the flip side of that is that I've also really loved sci-fi and horror films and as a result of that I was really into like special effects and the idea of handmade illusions because to me the one of the, the main things that I really love about painting is the fact that it is a handmade illusion um, and it's not quite what it seems. Um, so this to me related to special effects in that uh, they're creating these things that don't exist and making handmade illusions that are then used in films. And quite often as well with um, uh, special effects, they use like everyday materials. So sorry, that's Rob Bottom who did, who's quite well known in the 70s and 80s for doing like practical special effects. So rather than digital as things are now in the 70s and 80s, pre-computer uh, 
they did stuff. They'd make models and use household materials and then turn these mundane materials into something like fantastical, which I, to me, felt like what paint is <laughs> in some ways. Um, so yeah, so I, I began a, a love affair with finding out about special effects and began to do a bit of a deep dive for a couple of years. <laughs> uh, so one of the pieces of work, I, I made quite a lot of pieces of work around this time, but I'm just going to touch on the more, the ones that I felt were more successful. Um, so I feel like this playfulness feeds into the work that I'm making now, even though I'm focused on painting, there's still this feeling of playfulness in the work that I make, or that's the intention anyway. <laughs> so this piece of work is something that I made in 2011, um, and it's called Stars, and it's actually a photograph mounted on aluminium that's about a metre by 80, I think. Um, and I made this one by copying a special effects technique, whereby, which was used in a lot of films, uh, whereby you'd have a sheet of glass and then you'd scratch, or you'd paint the glass black with black paint, and then you'd scratch into the glass um, with like a scalpel to make the starscape patterns, and then you'd shine a bright light behind it, set it up with a bright light behind it, so it illuminates the little scratches and makes it look like stars. Um, so this is one that I did. I did a few around this time, and I found it really satisfying how you could just have these essentially scrap materials and then make sort of a galaxy <laughs> out of almost nothing. Um, and then around this time as well, I've always really loved, I've been in, really intrigued by this photograph uh, by Man Ray called Dust Breeding. And this is a photograph from 1917. Um, and it's a photograph that Man Ray took of the surface of the Duchamp sculpture, the large glass. Uh, and it was basically a photograph that he took when this sculpture had gathered years worth of dust. And then he, um, Man Ray uh, took a two hour long exposure of the surface of this sculpture. And then this is the resulting photograph. And what I really liked is how it's like this ephemeral thing like dust that you'd usually get wiped away. But then through the process of, <clears throat> excuse me, Man Ray photographing it, he's made it into something magical and that play between the, it, it could be something really zoomed in or to me it kind of looks like an airfield or buildings or something like that macro micro dynamic like the plane scale and then also around this time I've always really loved Tarkovsky but that sort of dug into like why <laughs> why I really like Tarkovsky and his book uh, Sculpting in Time which um, if you haven't read that, that's an uh, excellent book. And a lot of the things that he says can be applied to the process of painting, and even though he's talking about um, filmmaking. Um, and I always really liked the slowness and quietness of his films. And again, the, um, to me, they almost look like paintings that move. They've got this real contemplative, just really indulgent in <clears throat> like sensory, um, really beautiful, like visual poetry. Um, and again, yeah, just whizzing through some old work. So <clears throat> if you've got any questions on these, feel free to ask me later on. Um, and this one is a, a photograph that I made where I was photographing tabletop size models. So models maybe the size of a shoebox and then using little handheld torches and other little bits and pieces to put inside the box and then photographing it and then blowing it up. So. Um, you essentially start off with this little tiny model and then through the process of photography it could be it was the intention was to make it look like a stage where a musician would play or an actor as if someone's going to just walk into the stage light um and i think this was inspired by uh there was a phase from uh, tw 2002 up until just before the pandemic really where i was playing in bands quite a lot and playing music um, mostly playing guitar, sometimes singing <laughs> in various bands that I've been in. <clears throat> and around this time, uh, I was on tour a lot in a band called Gravenhurst. So I saw a lot of stages and a lot of lights. <laughs> and during that time, like I found it quite hard to make work. So um, I was on tour a lot and I couldn't really take an easel and paint. So <laughs> I wanted to have fun with me. So I started to take a lot of photographs and things. So, uh, so I think a lot of my work around that time was influenced by being in bands and music and stuff. Um, and then also <clears throat> around this time, I was interested in uh, another special effect technique um, 
called uh, cloud tanks. So this is a, a still, <clears throat> excuse me, from Close Encounters, the Spielberg film. So in the background, you can see there's clouds in inverted commas, <laughs> when actually these are created with a, a special effect technique called a cloud tank, where they'd have these industrial sized tanks with salt water in the bottom, which sinks, and then fresh water on top. And then you inject, um, so you can kind of see in this image a bit more. So the salt water is at the bottom, the fresh water is at the top, and then you inject um, milk or paint or different liquids. And then you watch how these play out on top of the salt water and it creates cloud formations, essentially. Um, so I've decided to try and take that on, albeit not on a Hollywood budget. <laughs> um, so my version of it was um, to, I bought a fish tank and then I had the salt water and fresh water uh, set up but on a much smaller scale. So this is a photograph that I made um, where I set up the salt water and the fresh water and then played around with different coloured paints and milk and all kinds of stuff. Um, and then photographed an area that was maybe an inch square. So. Again, it's that play on the absolute minutiae of things that you wouldn't even notice. But to me, there's like this whole world happening, um, which I was trying to log in. It's really good fun as well, actually. So after painting for a long time, it's quite nice to do something where I felt a bit more free and I, I didn't really know what I was doing in a way that kind of uh, it, it broke it wide open and I didn't know what the rules were. So I didn't feel like I'd follow any rules. Um, so this photograph was then presented as a a digital projection which is maybe like a meter and a half by a meter um on a thin screen and I, I liked how it had the feeling as if you could always like it could almost float off or as if you, if you looked back after a bit it might have like changed in some way um so again that playing with the things that are around us and making things that are mundane become something other um and another key development within my painting uh, was me and my sister Laura Lancaster who's also a painter um, we were asked to uh, we were invited rather to take part in a residency in uh, East Hampton in New York at the former studio of Elaine de Koonin who's a very famous abstract expressionist painter and the studio was also used by John Chamberlain who made the amazing like crushed vehicle sculptures in the like 70s and 80s which I really love those, the, uh, the colours and stuff. Um, so yeah, so we got asked to take part in a residency at the studio that they used to share, that, that they'd had at one time. Um, so that's one of my sister Laura's paintings. So we went uh, over to East Hampton. Uh, so these are Laura's paintings here, just to give you a flavour. Uh, and it was during a snowstorm as well, <laughs> which gave it a bit of a sort of a shining, uh, shining feel, a bit... Uh, yeah, <laughs> a bit overlook hotel. Um, and it was so snowy that we got snowed in, so it ended up being quite good for the production, <laughs> painting production route. Uh, and it was so cold that the sea froze, which is something that I've never seen before. Um, so this is in about 2015, and that's one of Elinda Coonan's self-portraits that was hanging up in the studio. So it was an amazing purpose-built painting studio, like heating and lighting designed for painting. So. At that point, I was flitting around between making paintings and doing other stuff. And I thought, well, I've got to do some painting in the studio. There's no two ways about it. So I went back to the painting, but with this sort of renewed feeling of experimentation and like freedom that I hadn't felt for a long time. Um, so these are just some shots of us. And this is some of the work that I made. So this one, they're quite big paintings actually, that two meters by, two and a half meters by a meter and a half. So again, touching on the themes of my early work, um, but this time, because I'd made the um, the filmic and the other moving image pieces, I had more a different relationship to the the painted space. So in this one of the telephone, I wanted it to feel as if the cord of the telephone was reaching out into the the viewer's space. So I started to become more playful, and this one was as if like the viewer could come up and like pull the curtains apart and see what was behind. Um, and again, that feeling of story and narrative and kind of thinking, like, what's happened here? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think with these paintings is more of an overt uh, influence of horror films and um, you know, like Dario Argento and things that are a bit more like dark 
in tone, perhaps, than my recent work. Um, and this one's of a blob, which is very satisfying to paint. <laughs> so that sent me off on a, <laughs> a tangent of watching loads of uh, horror films about blobs and the goo and stuff like that, because to me, that's what painting is. It's like this metamorphosized stuff that comes alive. <laughs> um, so the, the biggest uh, commission that I had to make a moving image was for a Tusk Festival um, in 2016. So Tusk Festival was a, a, a festival up in the lake. Um, <laughs> Someone's uh, joining in there. Tusk Festival was a, a sort of an alternative, for want of a better word, outsider music festival. And I worked with them on various different projects, like helping them put exhibitions on uh, with like Jad Fair and Andrew Chalk and Nurse with Wound. Um, yeah, and then through working with them, I got invited to. Uh, to take part in a commission for uh, Wolfgang Voigt, who's a really cool uh, German musician who runs Compact Records in Cologne. And in the 1990s, it was in a band called Gas. Um, so I was commissioned to make a piece of work to that would be shown a visual, like visuals for his live performance. Um, so you can see on this photograph here, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but at the bottom you can kind of see his head. So you can kind of see the scale of the visuals. <laughs> so he's at the bottom playing his music and then there's a massive screen behind him. And that was at the Northern Rock uh, Foundation Hall at this age uh, in Gateshead. Um, so I decided to make these visuals, I decided to go back to the cloud tank stuff, but in a more abstracted way, because I really enjoyed making those. And I thought they'd look really cool on the, the screen in the foundation hall where the visuals are playing. It was um, like the size of a double-decker bus, it was absolutely huge. So I really liked the cheekiness of filming something that was a square inch <laughs> and then projecting it absolutely huge. Um, so these are just some stills of the from the from the visuals that I made. So uh, Wolfgang Voigt sent me a piece of music, um, which was called uh, Rukva, excuse my German, but <laughs> Rukva Zauberung, which translates as uh, reverse enchantment. Um, so I made visuals that I felt fitted with the music. So I went away and filmed loads of cloud tank stuff and then edited it together. And then I, um, changed the opacities and changed the timings and then sort of edited them to the music that you sent me. Um, so I've got a clip of it actually, hopefully you'll be able to hear it. <laughs> so, oops. So the music's um, Wolfgang Voigt's and then I've made the videos. <laughs> leave that there actually because the the piece of work's over an hour long so we're gonna run out of time but if you wanted to see the full version of it i've got a youtube channel um which has 
the full the full version of it on there if you wanted to have a look in detail. So I'm going to skim through because I feel like I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll just there's just a couple more things um, that I wanted to show. Uh, whether the projects where I've collaborated with people. So um, me and again with my sister Laura, we took part in the project at Baltic 39 um, called Figure 4. And we got asked to make some work uh, in response to a brief that we could set for ourselves. So me and, me and Laura really liked this quote by Willem de Koonen. Um, so it says, uh, like, uh, Oops, let me just... <laughs> I'm in my element when I'm a little bit out of this world, then I'm in the real world, I'm on the beam, because when I'm falling I'm doing alright, when I'm slipping I say hey this is interesting, it's when I'm standing upright that bothers me, I can relate to that actually, <laughs> as a matter of fact I'm really slipping most of the time, I'm a slipping glimpser, um, so me and Laura like, really liked the idea that um, when you do the most interesting stuff, it's when you're not really sure what you're doing. And I, <laughs> and I think that's quite an interesting uh, thing to take on in a space the size of um, Baltic 39. <laughs> so we decided, me and Laura decided to respond to that quote. Um, and we called our project a slip and glimpser. And we basically set up two massive screens and two speakers and two projectors. Um, in the gallery space at Baltic 39 in Newcastle. And then we used this for, we had five days to do the project. So we basically used the five days in the space to play around and sort of make work that wasn't finished and just try and use the space in interesting ways. And using the um, projectors kind of like uh, a way to create a drawing in a, in a three dimensional space. Um, so Laura was really interested in cine films, so we edited a lot of cine films into loops and then we were projecting those and then I was recording the sounds of um, cine projectors and then looping the sounds and distorting them and then playing them in the space and then we had like still projections, we had film clips and then we had um, some stuff where we'd have like, like in this one you can see Laura's holding a mirror and then we'd try and like bounce the projection around the room so trying to have the same feeling of playing around, even though it's in a quite a formal gallery space. Um, so yeah, just kind of playing around, having a bit of fun. <laughs> but um, and it was the first time we've ever collaborated together on making something actually. Um, so I'll, I'll just skip through a bit, and then Laura, I kind of got making drawings in the space, um, and then we were just yeah using the projectors to fill the the room with different coloured light and. Uh, playing around with different ideas we had. I'm just going to skip through this. And then also alongside making paintings, for a while I was making my own music too, which um, I perform solo, and then I made um, uh, visuals. Uh, visuals for my live performance, so there's just a little clip of um, some of the music that I made and then there's some visuals that I made um, to go along with it. So for this, I filmed the corner of a TV screen um, and filmed different parts of the corner of a TV screen and then layered them on top of each other. So I got the, the texture of the, the LCD screen um, mixing with the film grain to, as a way to like, accompany the, the music that I'd made. So I'll just play a little clip. <laughs>
um, a YouTube channel with some stuff on for and uh, SoundCloud as well if anyone wants to investigate those more um, but more recently I've been focusing on painting but I feel like the there's definite influence of music and like a musical space that's, that I feel is still in my paintings um, so yeah it's so around about now we're getting up to about 2017 um, and I saw a really really amazing Maria Lasnig show at Tate Liverpool that blew my mind <laughs> and then um, I just really love her approach to making work um, so Maria Lasnig uh, was an Austrian painter who lived between 1919 and 2014 um, and I love the emotion and feelings in her work and how personal it feels and she's also quite playful um, and I feel like that what seeing someone I think seeing her be so confident and playful with her work was I kind of felt like oh I'd love to get some of that in, into my practice too. Um, but yeah, her paintings are amazing if you're not familiar with them. <laughs> um, so as a result, I was like, oh, I wonder what it would be like to make a painting where I didn't have a source image, because all of my paintings have been based on found images. Um, so I'd be holding a photograph in one hand and then painting it, like holding a permanently holding a photograph and then painting on the canvas, like sort of translating the, the photograph into a painting. So I began to make a series of paintings that were based on daydreams or loosely based on dreams, but images that I had in my mind's eye rather than actually a, a physical image. Um, so I sort of set myself a bit of a challenge because I'd been painting from a reference image for so long. I was just like, oh, what do you paint if you're not painting from photographs? <laughs> so let's find out. So I tried, um, <laughs> tried out. So then, um, so I'd have like an idea in my head. So this one was supposed to look like the back of a collar or like an epaulette or some gold. Uh, and these these are quite small, like maybe like A4 size, and they were painted wet and wet really quickly, which is also completely different to how we usually paint. But I tried to get the image down in in one go while it was while I was holding it in my head. So these aren't from source images, but I feel like off years of copying from source images, I have this like memory bank of like how to paint certain textures and stuff. Um, so this one was supposed to be like a bouquet or something hidden behind the cellophane. And then this one was like a, something bursting in some water. Um, and this one was just some like fabrics. So these were all painted without a, a reference image. And then they all, often started out as a drawing as well. Um, so they've got a different feel to them, but they still kind of have that photographic um, feel. And this is a painting that was uh, shortlisted for the Contemporary British Painting Prize in 2018. Um, so yeah, so these again touched on the ideas to do with memory and stored images, which I think has come through in the subsequent work that I've made. Um, so now we're getting up to current work. I think I'm doing okay for time. <laughs> I'll try and uh, try and keep it tight. So then, what people might not know as well that is drawing is quite integral to my practice and my decision making. Um, so I'm just going to show a few drawings that I've made. Sometimes the drawing will be a finished drawing, like this one was a more finished piece that I'll probably show. Whereas a lot of the time the drawings are, are working drawings as a means for me to make decisions. Um, so these, it started in lockdown actually when I started to make more drawings um, as a way to make work when I was trapped in the house. But then as a, as a result it's become like a really key part of my uh, of my process for making work. Um, so yeah, I, I use drawing as a way to decide what I feel. So these are all charcoal on paper, I should say. So I use the, the drawing as a way to help me start to break apart the source image um, and figure out which parts of the image are the, the key parts that I want to get across and which bits aren't as significant that I can blur out or miss out. And then also a means for me to try out how to create different textures in an interesting way on the surface. Um, Cause I was quite like an active surface in my paintings and drawings. Um, and I like the push pull between feeling that there's a lot of detail, but then you get up close and there's nothing there. And I think with drawing that relationships even more heightened. Um, and I like the, yeah, I like the playfulness of that. <clears throat> and it's a way for me to um, yeah start to be familiar with the different components of the image and figure out what, what kind of like the essence of the image it is that I want to get across. Um, 
So yeah, on this one at the bottom, you can see there's like a line where I'd previously thought I was going to cut off the composition there. Then when I started the drawing, I was like, oh no, that kind of looks a bit weird. So then I've made the drawing a bit bigger. Um, so it's a way for me to yeah, like an, sort of narrow down what the key parts that I want to get across. Um, and the cro cropping is quite key as well, because quite often I'll start a drawing and then I'll realise I have to crop in even more. So a lot of my new work is quite tightly cropped as a result of... Um, doing more drawings. Uh, so this one, so yeah, it's either the, they're quite loose, but then you feel like there's a lot of detail and then you get close up and there's nothing really then, I hope in quite a satisfying way. <laughs> so that's the, that's the drawing and then that's the result in painting. Um, so this is a painting that called Witness that um, the government art collection just acquired this recently, actually. Um, and then with this one, there's a real sense of the balloon might float off. So in, the cropping in this one's quite key. So the balloon's like right at the very top of the edge of the image, as if it's going to kind of blow out, like float off out of the painting. <laughs> and I, I also know that if the... Um, if the if the drawing works, so if it can be reduced down to black and white, and it still has this feeling of presence uh, and like uh, sort of mystery to it, I know that once I add the colour to it, it's going to make it work even better. So if if it doesn't pass the test of being drawn, it doesn't get painted. So quite often I'll make a drawing and then it won't end up being a painting because through doing the drawing, um, I'll realise oh no, it doesn't work actually. It's just what I thought was going to work didn't work. Um, so I'll just touch a little bit on the uh, the still life. So I've been really interested in Vanitas painting and I really love Clara Peters um, painting. So she was active and this is from like 1615. Um, and this one, I really like the, again, that the idea of taking everyday um, sort of textures and items and then making them magical in the way that you paint them and the way that your eye traces over the surface of the object so it's kind of like you can touch them with the eye as you're looking over the painting and in this one i really like how she often put these in her paintings where at the top on the i don't know if you can see my point about on the brown jug that's kind of in the middle on the on the metal lid um if you zoom in she's actually done a little portrait of herself in the top of the lid which i just thought was really a lovely bit of cheeky painting <laughs> which i'm all for <laughs> and so i think if you look in a lot of the painting there is like little sneaky portraits of her at a time when it would have been a bit more difficult for her to pass off a portrait of herself she sort of snuck one in there on the uh, on the still life <laughs> so that's influenced um some of the way that i approach painting objects and textures and like a sense of space and sort of playing on the traditions but then taking it in a different direction um it's catherine murphy as well a big fan of hers for anyone who loves a bit of, a bit of cheeky painting <laughs> um and then this is one of my favorite paintings actually that antoine volon and how he manages to make just a mound of butter it looks so delicious and like beautiful and it's got a real um the sense of like the thickness of the air in the painting in this one which i really like um, so yeah, all of those traditional painting techniques have sort of fed into some paintings that I made around lockdown of um, costumes and fabrics. So this is about, uh, this is oil on canvas and it's um, playing on the ideas of textures and colours and drapery and all those, that lovely stuff from like Singer Sergeant paintings and Monet and kind of doing it in my spin on those things. Um, and with these as well, actually, it might not be obvious necessarily, but there's no white paint in these. So a lot of the time I build up um, surfaces with successive really thin layers, glazes of oil paint, and then wipe back quite a lot. So the white on the painting is actually the white of the canvas wiped back through. So it makes for quite a, a lengthy painting process, but then the result is you get quite a good sense of backlit glow, which even though it looks like a touch in traditional painting, but then it's got this screen like glow, which sort of brings it back into like contemporary, the contemporary world. Um, and again, that everydayness, uh, um, so there's a couple of stills from David Lynch again, um, and the idea of like the everyday um, becoming like other. 
so there's just a painting of a cake that I did that had ants all over it. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to skip through some of these so I can touch on the beet paintings. Um, so, do, 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 do. so this is a, a show that I was in with my sister Laura. Um, and this is uh, oil painting that's like 70 by 50 by 70. Uh, and it's from a series of paintings that I made of packages. Um, touching on the Hitchcock idea of the MacGuffin. So that the MacGuffin is like an element that drives a story forward, but like in itself is unimportant. So you could have, like, say, the um, the briefcase from Pulp Fiction or numerous other things, or like a disc that someone needs to steal from a safe, whatever. <laughs> so in itself, it isn't important, but it drives the story forward. So I like the idea in these paintings where um, it's the mystery of not knowing what's inside the parcel that creates like an intrigue. And if you did know what was in it, it might be a bit disappointing, but it's the wondering what's inside that... Um, that makes it satisfying to look at. And then again, just some close ups. You can see there's nothing there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Cadence was a show that I took part in. Um, it was a duo show between myself and Laura, where it's the first time we've shown our work together. So this was at Workplace Gallery in London um, in 2023. Yeah, January 23. Um, and this one, this one's called Sleep Grip. Um, and this touches on, this is like uh, 80 by 100 centimetres. Um, and this is a good place to drop in that. I didn't use to title my work, um, but recently through it being really confusing while all of your paintings are untitled and people have to just try and describe what the work is when they're referencing stuff. I actually, through perhaps doing music and writing lyrics, um, I've got really into titling the works and using the title as a way to give the viewer like, extra information that they can then interpret and how people interpret the titles differently. So this one's um, called Sleep Grip. So it sort of uh, refers to the, um, the, the sort of the point of being between awake and asleep and trying to grab on to something. So it's kind of like the, the fleetingness of like a memory or so the idea of trying to grip on something and then the more you try and grip it, the harder it is to define what it is. So they're usually just uh, uh, titles that you can take in different directions, really, rather than being too prescriptive. Um, and this one's called Apport. Um, uh, this one's called In, Go in Ghost Light. Um, so this one it's a, an image of um, theatre or stage makeup on a table um, and in theatres they have a thing called the ghost light which they leave on to sort of as good luck to ward off all the so there's a, a stage light that they leave on all the time in a theatre to ward off evil spirits which I quite like the idea of referencing that in a pen <laughs> um, and this is an Alex Katz painting so I've, I've always really liked Alex Katz even though his style of painting is quite different to me <laughs> um, but I really like a quote that I heard by him recently on a podcast where he said um, that he likes to uh, paint rather than depicting something, he likes to to create the sensation of seeing something. And he said, I sometimes leave out the thing and paint the sensation, which I was like, oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> so I've kind of I've taken that on board and tried to, I've had that in mind with a few of my recent works. Um, and this one's called Permanence. So there's a bit of a theme of jewellery um, in recent works. And the idea that like something that you wear a lot, as if it, if it could tell a story, like what would it say? Like things that you carry around with you a lot and they kind of hold the stories of the places that they've been. Um, so you can see there on a the close up, it's like there's quite loose up close. Uh, And then there's a few recent works I've done where they're like um, sort of portraits almost, or my version of a portrait, and sort of questioning what a portrait is. Um, so with this one, I wanted it to have the feel of a person recalling recalling a person from memory or someone just out of view or just on the periphery of like remembering what they look like. Or when you try to remember someone, the, the feeling that, that you have when you think about them rather than what they look like. Quite hard to do in painting, but I think the more successful ones hit on that. 
uh, and then now um, there's some work from a show, a solo show that I did called In the Work. Uh, so that's a drawing. So there's a bit of theme of, again, following on the theme of like fabrics and bedding. So yeah, I think I've got too many slides, so I'm just going to skip through. <laughs> it's through a couple. <laughs> and then, oh yeah, Rembrandt painting of um, a roof. All of that good stuff from the Rembrandt paintings that are in the National Gallery that I love to go and see. <laughs> um, and again, there's like the, this is called uh, A Thousand Faces. So it's the idea of the things that you use every day and the amount of times that you use them to like uh, as a routine in your day times. So this is from a show that I uh, in the wake, which was last November at Workplace Foundation in Newcastle. Um, again, touching on similar themes to the works that are in the Beep, uh, the Beep show. Um, and this one, there's, I definitely love a balloon. <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, there's something about balloons that I've, I'm not quite over yet. I love the, the, the surface tension um, and the feeling of solidity and floatiness and the, it somehow marries with the, the painting technique that I've hit on at the moment that seem to really work well together. Um, so these are the paintings from, sorry, I've skipped through a bit just because I'm running out of time, but um, so these are the paintings from the Beep Show currently. Um, so this one is called Onlooker. And just to give you an idea, there's one of the drawings. Um, so that's the finished painting, and that's the drawing. So you can see there's quite a difference between them, but uh, the drawing's just a means for me to try and open up like the mark making. Um, and then this one. The, the thin place. So the thin place is it where um, in the spiritual world or not that I'm into that kind of thing, but I like the idea that it's it refers to something being both alive and dead at the same time. And this one's called burst. So it refers to like the burst of information, but then also uh, how balloons can burst. Uh, I wanted this one to have the feeling of um, like uh, a party, like like is the party just finished like where am i has it got a bit of a nostalgia but it's a bit creepy um and there's quite a dense atmosphere in itself the paintings like quite abstract and again you can see the sort of thinness of the painted surface which might not come across sometimes in the documentation but in in the flesh so you can kind of see it in. So again, there's the theme of um, jewellery. Um, so there's just a couple of shots of the Beep exhibition. And again, I wanted it to be, I usually like to hang my work so it's quite, it's quite spacious, like there's a lot of space between them. Um, and then, so there's room for you to sort of interpret like what's happening between the different images. And this one's all that's left behind. Uh, and this one's called Night Starts to Move. Here's a couple that are just from uh, a show, a group show that I was in in um, Hong Kong at the shop house. Um, and this one's called Echo's Answer. So it's the idea that um, there's an echo back and forth between um, what's happening in the painting and the viewer. And you can never really get a, like, a definitive answer, it just like echoes backwards and forwards. So I like to use the title as a way to direct the viewer or to give a bit of information that you might not expect. Um, and this one's called Disappearer. 
so it's like the feeling that the person's going to disappear out of view as if they're walking through the the little window that you're looking into um this one's called uh, only days in between and this is on show um an exhibition called soft focus in montreal at the moment so this should do a little close up uh, and this one's called playback um it's quite small, you can see, yeah, the next one you can kind of see the size. Um, so this one I wanted it to be as if each time um, you look at the painting, it's kind of like a recording that plays itself back each time you look at the painting. And I wanted to capture the feeling of like stage light or coloured light reflected in the hair. So usually with my new paintings, actually, they start off with a quite a strong um, intention and then once I hit that intention I know the painting's finished so it might be an intention to get a certain feeling across or a certain texture so a lot of the paintings that I'm making at the moment all start with a really specific intention um, and this one's called Arms Reach and that's opening this week in a group show in Seoul um, called Home and Away and that's the last one but yeah, I might leave it there so there's time for questions. Thank you.